Good morning, Hildor. Good morning, good morning. How are you? You look like you're in paradise over there this morning. Yes, I'm sitting here next to my milkweed. Uh, oh. I'm, I'm just sitting patiently waiting for the monarch to arrive. Uh, uh -huh. I come here uh, every morning. This is my front lawn. It's been, uh, it's been transformed into a rewild habitat. Oh, wow. It's just, it looks, it looks heavenly. And I, I can hear, uh, you know, songs of the 60s playing in my head. I'm, I'm really uh, quite uh, in envy of where you're at right now. So I Gold, Golden Alexander, Milkweed. Um, yeah, it's, it's beautiful here. So I'm Keith Fiveson uh, at workmindfulness.com for the Center of Wellbeing. And Hildor, Dr. Hildor, Paul's daughter, uh, you are uh, heading up uh, Rewild and you're involved with the Science Center and we're doing the show here, your environment now, and you've already given us a peek into your environment now. So what do we have cooked up for today? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I'm on the board of the Science Museum of Long Island. Um, and we are pleased that we can actually offer in-person camp this summer, uh, small group. So I, I just want to start with that. But on that note, in terms of education, and especially environmental education, I am pleased to introduce my dear friend and someone I respect uh, tremendously, Ranger Eric Powers from the Center of Environmental Education and Discovery. He speaks Aulish. I think that's like the most impressive. I, I, I'll, I'll always um, refer to him because he doesn't like the idea of playing a recording because he doesn't want to uh, mess with bird life like that. But he wants the owl to understand that this is a human trying to speak to he the owl. Owlish. Owlish, is that right? Owlish, yeah. What a hoot. What a hoot. He, he talks to owls. And I, I think that's a good way to start. But I'd love to know how to support his work um, in terms of environmental education. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. So, good morning. Good morning. Wow. So, thank you. What an introduction. And uh, I got to have you do all my intros. Uh, <laughs> so, well, thanks for having me here, and I feel very much at home. These are, you guys are all my friends, and, uh, um, and I, it's good to, good to see everybody again. Uh, what, uh, what I've started here is uh, seed. We planted a seed, and, uh, but it's spelled a little differently. It's spelled with a C, and it stands for the Center for Environmental Education and Discovery. So um, uh, my name is Eric Powers, and I'm a wildlife biologist and a uh, uh, self uh, self um, uh, self appointed um, nature center director. And I really have found that my skill set is is perfect for running a nature center, um, and it seems to uh, uh, mesh very well with my ADHD and my OCD and all those things, and um, helps me to run a very busy and flourishing nature center. But I've been running nature centers for about uh, uh, 25 years now uh, in, in this country and even in another country. And, and I've, I've found that I, I feel like we need to rediscover what a nature center is and how a nature center functions. So when I opened up Seed, um, I was kind of putting it out there that we are nature center 2.0. We are taking it to the next level and, and pushing forward this, this movement of rewilding and, and connecting back to our roots so that we can move forward in a more positive direction. I think it's important to, um, to not just blaze forward, but to understand where you've been, where we've been as a human society and, and where we should be going. And, uh, and then that way you can be in the moment today. And, with so many things going on, eight billion people, with uh, overcrowded cities, with um, uh, with our whole, uh, you know, um, uh, what is it, the mass extinction happening right now? There's so many problems. White nose syndrome with our bats, and lack of insects, and sudden uh, die off with our honeybees, and it's just thing after thing after thing. The the algal blooms in the in the bay that that uh, Save the Great South Bay is, is um, working so hard to, to stop. And, and just all these things. And I feel like a nature center's role 
is to help pull together the community to address all of these things. And we should be, our nature center should be the hub for all these activities. And so I created SEED with uh, Rebecca Mullers and she and I have uh, re-envisioned what we can do. And what we've, what we've decided is that we, we can be a hub for all these activities, a clearinghouse, if you will, when people come to us with interests to direct them in the place where their energies are gonna, are gonna sit with them the best. And maybe that's with a class that we offer here, or maybe it's working with Save the Great South Bay or going for a mindful walk with um, uh, Long Island Forest Walks with Linda. So I have a question for you just uh, very quickly. It sounds like uh, you know the Center for Environmental Education and Discovery is really doing a lot to go ahead and uh, bring life literally into people's uh, way of uh, seeing the world around them. How do they? How do people get a, a hold of you? What's your website? Just right away, just so we know that up front. Yeah, so our website is uh, seedli.org, and we spell seed with a C. Great. So c e e d l i dot o r g. So you're a nonprofit as well. Yep, we're official five hundred one c three. We're also a little different in that we have an amazing board of directors that are very hands on very active. Um, I see board of directors almost daily, uh, which in my experience, board of directors have always kind of been in the, in the background, uh, but our board is, is, um, is really just amazing dynamos. Great, and you also take donations or, you, uh, uh, or is it just sort of uh, private funding or how does that work? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, unfortunately, you know, to start something like this, you would hope to have an endowment and have a few million dollars under your belt before you uh, undertook this endeavor. And uh, we did it completely wrong or whatever, backwards. And we got the center. We, it's just been a grassroots effort to, um, and like-minded people really, that believe in our mission and believe in working together and believe that um, we're gonna solve our environmental crisis by coming together and not by doing our own individual thing, that, um, that we see our, our community as a, as a much greater thing, that, that if I, if I um, pull out all the invasives out of my yard and, and go organic and native, that that has a benefit for the greater community. And, and can you please share with us your location and why you picked that location? Yeah. Well, we did land in a sweet spot, I gotta say. There was an abandoned mansion in the hamlet of Brookhaven. So we're on the south, uh, we're on the south shore, uh, right on the Great South Bay, uh, right, next to, right in between Bellport and Wertheim uh, National Wildlife Refuge. We are on 76 acres of property um, in a big mansion. And now granted the mansion does need some uh, renovation before we can um, open the building up to the public, but, um, but the grounds are open. We're now converting the grounds back to uh, ripping out the invasives and converting it back to natives. Um, and so we can start having um, uh, like uh, our friendly foraging walks to learn what you can eat out here, how to make medicines from our forest and our fields. Um, and how all these things, you know, should be able to uh, support us, uh, you know, physically uh, in, in life. So Eric, a question, uh, what uh, percent of the property is uh, invasive and what native and, and what are the top three invasives that you're fighting? Yeah, so I think we're dealing with about, um, out of the 76 acres, we probably have about, I would just a guesstimate, I haven't done a, a, uh, an exact census, but I would just say, 25 to 30 percent of our property has invasives on it. Our top mm -hmm. three invasives are the um, the euonymus, the burning bush. Terrible. The um, uh, the bla is it black spiderwort? Am I getting that name right? It's a new one on me, but we'll kill it anyhow. Yeah, it's uh, it's a <laughs> spiderwort, and uh, it's highly invasive uh, in our grasslands and uh, in the. I know mugwort, but. Uh... Right. Yeah, mugwort is not has nothing on this one. Oh boy. 
And, um, and then the third one is probably bittersweet. Mm. That's, that's bittersweet. No yeah. Sweet, yeah. I, 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 uh, who is on your shoulder there? I, I like your... This, this is one of our animal ambassadors. So, um, <laughs> uh, so you asked where we get our funding from earlier. And uh, we, we get our funding from donations. We rely heavily on donations, but also for the programs that we teach. We go into schools all across Long Island from Manhattan to Montauk. And, and uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's, um, we have amazing programs, getting kids involved and hands-on, and a lot of it revolves around our animal ambassadors. Mm -hmm. um, and these are animals that have been rescued from different circumstances. Who knows uh, all their different backgrounds? And I just, I just rescued a lizard yesterday um, whose owner passed away, and the family just didn't know what to do with them. They're like, it's not my lizard. I don't want a lizard. I don't know what to do with it. So I went and got them. And if, and, and I helped to rehome these animals, but every once in a while you get one that is super friendly and loves the attention of people and doesn't eat children. And, uh, and then we christen them our animal ambassadors. Like my daughter will never forget when you put the boa constrictor on her shoulders. <laughs> she was like six. You're the only person I'd like I would, to add. Uh, I would trust no one else with that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to add that we've, we've brought Eric to our school, uh, the Wheatley School, for our Earth Week Festival for what, Eric, the last four or five years or something? Yeah, like I'm not sure. Yeah, I've, I've been doing this Earth Week Festival at Wheatley for, I think it's 22 years now. And trust me when I tell you, it's hard to find really good presenters. You could find people that really know their stuff. You could find people that are really passionate. But you can't always find someone who just knows how to communicate and connect with, in my case, high school kids. And Eric does. I'll, I'll never forget the first time you came in and I, I don't consider myself a control freak, but I was freaking out. He, there were, I don't know, 150 kids in the auditorium and they're holding walking sticks and ball constrictors and petting dogs and, and, and spiny anteater, like, you know, all these, oh, he had all kinds of crazy things. And, and it was working. Everybody was just kind of being gentle and everybody was being enthralled with the animals and he was interacting with, in a way that, that just worked. It, it blew me away. So, it worked the first year, so I just bring it back every single year. When you find somebody good, something good, you stick with it. And Eric is good. <laughs> yes, and, and I also am always touched by the respect. You have uh, this sense of respect for wildlife. And it's, uh, it's not a, uh, you know, there is the, the type of like ecotourism that's like a safari, like let's go look, you connect. And I, I, one of the most memorable nature walks I've been on, and uh, I just was touched by that when you said that you'd never play a recording of bird sound, of sounds because you, you would like them to know that you're a human trying to connect and, and not to confuse them as if, you know, it could be territorial sounds, you could be playing from a recording, right? So you don't want to uh, interfere with the bird life, but you'd like to talk to them. So could you just speak about when you learned Owlish and, and why and, and how that's going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, um, so first off, I just remembered it's uh, the invasive is... Um, is black swallowtail wart. Black swallowtail. Oh. Right. So it's the black swallowtails. That's how the, the term black gets in there. It's the black swallowtails, I think, that might use it for um, for their eggs, but it's not from it's not from around here. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Thank birds, you. Birds carry these things. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, Hilder. Uh, what was your question now? What was uh... I, I just I just wanted to know uh, how and when you learned to speak to owls. Ah, yeah. Well, that probably I mean, my sisters will attest that I was an obnoxious little boy, an obnoxious little brother, and I was always a noisemaker, which was why uh, my parents channeled me through uh, percussion, so I could just make all sorts of noises and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but also I learned uh, very early on that I could whistle in a lot of different ways. I can whistle probably like five or six different ways. Um, and, and by 
shaping your mouth, um, you can make different sounds. And I, uh, I started off, you know, I said I was obnoxious, but I started off with this dripping. I would, I, you know, I, I said I was ADHD. I would wake up as a child in the middle of the night with nothing to do except try to annoy my sisters. And so I would sit, I would hide somewhere and I would make this sound. I would go. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's a dripping sound. And so then somebody would get up and like, ah, oh, there's a faucet dripping somewhere. <laughs> and they'd get up and check all the faucets and I'd be sitting there like laughing and then they'd go back to bed and then I would start dripping again. And uh, so, you know, That's just brilliant just like that. But then I learned, you know, I was a nature kid. My parents got me video games and stuff like that. And I just had no interest in, in that. Um, I wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to be catching animals um, and watching them and, and stuff like that. And, and it was kind of fun because I was, I was okay with catching stuff and then letting it go. I didn't need to feel the need to keep it because tomorrow I'll go find it again. Um, so, um, but just to go out there and observe things like, um, like, um, like this little guy here, this little stick bug and stuff like that. And, um, you know, and it was like here on Long Island, we have our own species of stick bug and, and I didn't see uh, any of them until Hurricane Sandy when all those trees came down and, uh, and we were clearing brush and whatnot. That's when, uh, you know, that's when I started seeing some of those, uh, these walking sticks. So, and then I was like, wow, so let me try to uh, keep some of these for education programs. Here's a real Long Island native. But then I quickly found out that they are programmed to only live for the summer. So even if you bring them indoors, they still die uh, when winter, when the, uh, at the onset of winter. So for me to do education programs year round, I needed a tropical species. So I happened to find uh, this species. This is a, a Vietnamese walking stick. And, uh, and it brings in some other cool topics that we can talk about then. Um, uh, you know, animals that live in the canopy of a rainforest or, um, or in this case, uh, a specialized breeding uh, pathway. This, this animal, this species of walking sticks have no males. There's no males of their species. They reproduce through parthenogenesis and, and essentially uh, biological cloning. Um, so her daughters will be identical to her. And I think that's just a fascinating concept. Um, and, and I know your high schoolers love that, um, that concept too. They were, their minds were like Pow. So I have a question for you. Um, and my question is uh, around communication. And, you know, here you are uh, with seed and you have this wonderful preserve and you have these wonderful animals with you. Do you feel that you, um, ha besides the sounds, do you feel that there are other ways of communicating with uh, not only nature, but with the animals? Yeah, absolutely. And by, um, you know, by converting our forest back to natives, I think is a great way to communicate to our local wildlife that, you know, um, you know, we have vacancy now, um, <laughs> come here. Uh, we've been putting up um, uh, bat houses, bird houses, owl boxes, things like that. We need to do a lot more. We, I've been partnering up, yeah, partnering with uh, LINPI, you know, Long Island Native Plant Initiative. They've been very instrumental helping us to replant uh, some of our, uh, we're going to go section by section of our big field out here. Um, Cause right now we're hovering at around 90% non-native species in our, in our field. And so we're slowly converting that back to a native grassland. And, and already we're seeing, uh, we're seeing new species of butterfly that we've never seen here. And, and new, all sorts of stuff. I'm sorry. Was there a question there? And here's Lovey. This is she's another rescue. This is a um, an albino uh, collared dove that we use for education programs, and she's fully flighted. So she often takes off uh, for a spin around the classroom uh, when we go in and all. But um, it, it's been interesting that um, you know I've had some criticism in the past that you know we're exploiting the animals or you know they're not. It's not natural to 
basically stick them in a, in a travel box and take them from class to class and be handled so much. Um, and it's always been um, hard to describe and put into words that, you know, that these animals enjoy this and that this is, this is their, their life. And, and it goes back to, you know, that when you have a pet, it's, uh, it's not just food and water and housing, but it's also love. You know, it's, it's, these animals need a, a, a partner, a, an interaction, a, a family, if you will, to be with. And even my snakes and my lizards and uh, turtles and tortoises, and they all, um, and look at Lovey, she's snuggling here with my, with my hand. She just, she loves to smush her face into my fingers and snuggle. You know, and if I don't do this every day, she's lonely. And so we, um, uh, and so now though, during this shutdown, during this pandemic, uh, we've been on lockdown for, you know, as long as everyone else. And I've noticed a change in the animals, honestly, in my animal ambassadors. And I would have to describe that as depression because they're not getting out, they're not interacting. And now I can feel like I can, uh, finally say uh, to any critics i'm like i saw a noticeable depression when we weren't using them so these animals really have um you know really do enjoy getting out there and showing us what they're all about right so by the you, same but, i'm sorry by the you, same token uh, i've noticed a, a lot of a lot more birds in my property it seems like as we calm down, uh, na nature amp amped up a bit. Are you seeing more birds? Yeah, well, um, um, honestly, I can't say because I've, uh, um, I, I'm pretty much out there almost every day anyways, um, even before the pandemic. So I, I feel like I'm seeing um, still the uh, uh, same numbers of birds, honestly. Um, what I feel like though, is that there's, uh, I hear a lot of people saying that though, that they're, they're seeing more. And I think it's just that um, people are able to take a breath and a pause and look around. And I think people are noticing nature. And, and I think something good that's come out of this is that people are starting to really appreciate their outdoor spaces and, and, um, and look forward to going out there. And, and people have been coming by here and um, and hiking our trails, and they're like, wow, this was great, we saw this, we saw that. Um, have you ever seen that before? And, I, and I'm like, well, yeah, um, that's, <laughs> it's always been here. And I'm glad you're seeing it, though, because it's, it's special for you, and that's, and that's what's important. Um, so, but I don't have, I don't, I'm not currently doing really any, um, any scientific studies. Uh, we've, I've just had to focus all my efforts on our education programs and our fundraising efforts to um, to renovate this house so that we can open it up finally to the public. Uh, the final phase of, of construction on this house is actually going to be opening up a retreat center. We're, get, we're saving 10 bedrooms, so we'll be able to house up to 20 people at a time here to do whatever we want to do. Do we want to bring in uh, shark scientists for a month and we can house 20 of them here and do an in-depth study of our local sharks or something like that or we can bring in special people and and focus on the uh the red tides you know and uh, try to clean up our bays we can we can have these intensives uh if you want to do um a rewilding weekend people could come from all over the tri-state area and actually we have international airport um in 20 minutes away so uh, if you want to fly over from, uh, from Spain and join us for the weekend or a week, um, so we can have these nature-based retreats where we want to take the education and really just bump it up a notch so that you're going to take this information, go home, and implement it. I love this. This is, this is actually a, probably the most important work right now is to reconnect and and your connection to nature that's what uh I, you're still uh uh your connection to nature is still uh your uh no actually i've uh, you moved I, I closed down i closed down my company yes i've channeled all of that business into the nature center intercede okay so I, I closed down um your connection to nature 
and, uh, and brought all those programs and all the schools under seed. So now I'm under a much bigger and, and frankly, much more organized. Yes. Um, and, w and with supporting roots, because no one is meant to be alone. And I think the depression you noted in your animals, I have a very cheerful uh, kids, but in these three months of sheltering and being sort of removed from their friends, it, it's been absolutely awful to, um, you know, deal with, but it makes us appreciate our friends more than ever before. So now we're back out uh, in, in, in small groups. And uh, it just, it's just uh, the principle, the very principle of life is, is based on that interdependence, the interconnected uh, nature of all things. And I think if we, if we really understand our breath, we'll understand that we're not breathing it, that it's coming from somewhere. And there seems to be a disconnect uh, in our culture that there's a lack of respect for the very source of life. <laughs> Yep. And that's, I think, if that could be uh, taught on every uh, grade level, that's a start. There's yep. another way of uh, thinking of the phrase, I can't breathe. I mean, we're yes. suffocated by this world in one way or another. Yes, and it's time that we, we, we really start recognizing what matters, each other, and the living world. Mm hmm Trying to get my dove to call back. <laughs> I I am fascinated. I I I I I really was touched when you were having a conversation with was it the screech owl? Yeah. Yeah, at the preserve, at the Sands Point Preserve, we were walking in the night, and you and they would answer you, and you'd have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. And then they came really close, and they're like, "Oh, it's a human," and they left. Uh huh. Like yeah. the, so you, I love you, talking to screech owls. They go. Like that. Yeah, beautiful. See, look, I got Lovey to come. Yes, she's like, <laughs> she's like, the, it, it just, it-, it Wait, that, that's, that's dangerous if the dove comes when, it, when it's an owl call, isn't it? No, I, I was calling her earlier and she came. Uh oh, I, I know. To the owl call. <laughs> but she has no fear of, of, of the owl call, that's, and that's dangerous, but probably because her genetics are programmed for uh, Northern Africa and not uh, North America. And, and I like talking with children about our common ancestors. So really actually recognizing that the reason why we feel good in nature with animals is because we're actually relatives. We're just distant relatives. So we're all family. We're, we're, we're closest of kin because we're human, but then pieces of, of my DNA I can find in common, shared in common with uh, almost all of land life, right? Right, so, there's so, a whole field of study, you know. Um, that that looks at our commonalities between species. It's called uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, and it's a very fascinating uh, uh, arena of science. And what I love, uh, Eric, is I, I really love the interconnectedness, the idea that it's all energy and sound, that you know there's all uh, that we're all breathing uh, the same breath. All, all sentient beings are, and uh, then, you know, we're all uh, really living uh, from the land and uh, from the earth, which is our, which is, is giving us breath and, you know, one breath at a time. Um, so I, I, I think it's really beautiful the way you've articulated it uh, in a way that uh, doesn't necessarily, um, it's sort of, it's beyond the words that you really said, and it's much more around the intention uh, and the sounds of uh, the work that you're doing uh, in relationship to um, not only the uh, place that you're at, but also the animals that you're working with. So thank you so much. Mm. This is uh, really very, very poignant. And, and, uh, and yes, and before we end today, Keith, I'd like to introduce Marshall, who will be leading our next segment on Bay Friendly Yards. Well, uh, just to say, uh, <laughs> Right. What I'm going to talk about really fits hand in glove with what Eric's been discussing. Um, the, uh, the 0.4 acres I grew up on uh, is um, in the process of being converted to uh, native habitat of 10,000 square foot. There's going to be a red maple swamp forest in the front yard and uh, uh, we have uh, a, a, um, 
uh, an American chestnut and an Atlantic white cedar to plant, but also just following D Doug Talamay's uh, blueprint and uh, create all sorts of, uh, um, you know, micro habitats to attract uh, various uh, butterflies and birds. Um, yeah, uh, Frank's coming over a little later today and we're gonna lay out how that's all gonna look and we can't, we really look forward to, uh, to coming to seed and, 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 uh, and see, seeing what you guys are doing there. And with Save the Great South Bay, you have a program called Creek Defenders. I, yes. I, I, well, I, I mean, love that. Yes, the Creek, the creek Defenders, uh, there's some, as it turns out, 50 uh, creeks, rivers, and streams that flow uh, from the South Shore into the Great South Bay. And uh, we um, promote uh, local stewardship. Uh, there are some 16 communities through which these uh, 50 uh, creeks, rivers, and streams flow. And for each of those uh, 16 communities, uh, uh, we have or will have uh, creek defenders. Uh, uh, this year, we were in the, in the 50th, uh, in the celebration of 50 years of Earth Day, we we're to have 50 clean, uh, cleanups. But, uh, uh, well, you know, um, things, uh, things happen. But part of our strategy, actually, is to um, uh, rebuild native habitat al along the, uh, the banks of the creeks by way of uh, filtering the groundwater. Uh, once it gets into the creek, it's too late. So uh, that's part of the problem. The, the, main, the, the base problems begin on the mainland which is why what SEED is doing is so very important. Yes. Marshall, can, can I ask Marshall a question? Um, you said you have an American chestnut. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, well, um, my partner, uh, Frank uh, Piccinini, uh, uh, became interested in, in helping to, uh, uh, there's a, an inoculation method. I'm, sh I'm sure uh, Eric will know a lot more about this than I do, uh, using something called cruddy bark, where he, uh, you can take um, uh, chestnuts from still, still um, alive uh, American chestnuts where you can still find them. Um, and then from there, I mean, we have some like 35 little uh, ch American chestnut saplings now that we're planting about. Um, and we'd like to get a billion of them. That'd be nice. <laughs> that's, that's how many of them we lost. That's right. Marshall, I'd like to be in touch with you about that. I, I work uh, at a camp actually where Hilda was supposed to be working this summer also, use them, but the camp is not running this year, alas. Um, but they've got a lot of chestnuts in the woods. But of course, well, if we, we turn out to be the Johnny Appleseed of chestnuts, I mean, Eric, maybe, maybe devote a certain portion of your property to growing chestnuts and finance the whole thing that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I would love to, I, I see you shared with us, Eric, uh, about the summer solstice uh, celebration. Yes, so our summer solstice, we always celebrate our native plants, our wildlife, and our indigenous peoples. So um, we kind of uh, equate it with a mini powwow, as a matter of fact. And this year, we're not able to meet in person, so we're going to be doing it virtually. So you don't have to go anywhere other than uh, from the comfort of your own home to join us on that on that day. And that's during that time period is when the actual minute of the solstice is happening. We'll there be there. Go. Thank you for inviting us. And there, I also put in a link to our, um, our video about seed if you wanna learn more about it. It's only what, three and a half or four minutes long. Cool. Yes, we'll be sharing that alongside with this um, recording from today. So thank you for for coming on Yana 10, it rhymes. I like that. <laughs> you like that? We, we, this is how we've been passing time in this time, feeling connected despite uh, being separated in space. So we can actually connect mm -hmm. through this kind of- Well, I, I reject the whole term social distancing. It's physical di distancing. Uh, uh, the, uh, the social part, I think we're having to be more innovative. And I think we've had to really, um, rethink our relationship to all the people and, and objects in our lives. We're stuck with both on a daily basis. And so we, um, we, there's been a, a, a lot of deep dives and I think it's sort of gotten us back to nature in yeah. a funny way. And I would agree with that. And I really want to, uh, again, underscore the energy and the intention uh, that goes into calls like this and into the work that everyone's doing uh, to share that with uh, not only the people that are on the 
uh, on the show, but also the people that will be watching this later on and uh, those people, uh, hopefully that'll come just uh, not intentionally, but just sort of wander in and have a, have a bit of an epiphany and say, oh, wow, I need to be doing something more. So, you know, thank you all so much. Uh, Hildor, uh, thank you uh, for leading this off, uh, Earth Mother that you are. Uh, and uh, for, uh, you know, really giving us an example. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for your, for your um, well, your energy, uh, because clearly you're communicating in ways that defy the English language. And, uh, you know, that's really what we all need to be doing. And we look forward to next week. Uh, Marshall, you'll be uh, uh, keynoting or uh, topping us off with some insights in terms of uh, the work that you're doing and your insights as to what's going on or what may happen, yeah? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss Bay-Friendly Arts more in depth, uh, what they mean, and um, we'll also have some really cool uh, footage of uh, uh, large trees being taken down, mm. at, mm -hmm. at a minimum. Maybe the goats. Oh, good. There will be goats involved at some point. Good, good. But, so we'll... but please clarify, it's the, the trees are Norway maple, let me guess. Okay. <laughs> yeah, three, yeah. Three, Norway ma three Norway maples. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not encouraging uh, taking down trees unless <laughs> they're, the, they're the, the bad kind, right? <laughs> well, I, 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 I spared uh, three 80-foot Douglas firs. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. they don't belong here. <laughs> Well, yeah. good. So we'll look forward to that. In the meantime, uh, for those people who want to get more information, again, we have the information for SEED uh, and their website. It's SEED, C-E-E-D-L-I dot org. And uh, Hildor, uh, your website, would you like to give uh, listeners your website as well? Uh, RewildLongIsland.org for uh, the Native Plant Initiative we started here. Um, and um, SOL.center, if anybody's looking for mindfulness and meditation in this time. Great, and uh, we'll be posting this also at the UCC Manhasset Center for Wellbeing, that's uccmanhasset.org, as well as uh, the workmindfulness.com website, and this will be going up on our YouTube channel and many others as well. And we'll share the link for everyone uh, that would like to have the link uh, to post on their site. So Great. I wanna thank you all very much, I'm gonna be, uh, we're going to end this for, for now, uh, but look forward to our next show, which will be next, uh, what is it, Yen at 10 on, on, on Wednesdays. Exactly. All righty. Thanks for having us, Keith. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for taking the time. <laughs>